we pray. Father, we thank thee in Jesus' name, thy Son, for the goodness that thou hast uh, blessed us with, for the help and the privilege of being out here this afternoon together together in the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. Break the bread of life to every one of us, Father. We pray that the Holy Spirit will come and take the words of the Bible, God's own word, and give it in every heart as we have need, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. And good afternoon, friends. A privilege to be here today, this afternoon. Just a little late, but this time it wasn't my fault. It was the staff. I was here at 2.30 as a promise. But they were the ones who were late this time, and that makes me feel kind of good, you know, when they're always telling me I'm late. Where you been? What's <laughs> your hurry? And now this time it's them the ones that's late. So uh, it comes right back. If Brother Woods is in the, the, the church, I can't see him anywhere, but if Brother Woods is here, Billy wants to see you in the back, Brother Woods. I couldn't see him here in the recording pit here, and, and I couldn't see him with his wife sitting there, but I just, if he's here anywhere, Brother Woods, Brother Banks Woods, our book salesman, uh, Billy Paul wants to see you in the back about loading the books and things to be ready to leave. Now, I thought maybe... Uh, if we wouldn't have been a little late, I was going to get on a subject this afternoon of Mel Chazity, the high priest. But being that we don't have too much time now, not over 40 minutes, I guess at the longest, uh, we're going to have to change the subject. So we'll try another, another scripture here to read. And then tonight, I don't like to run right up in this kind of a meeting till just a jumping off spot and then hit the, the prayer service because... I'm wanting and praying and trusting to God that he will give us the greatest outpouring of divine healing power tonight that we've ever seen in Chicago. Not because it's this meeting, but because there's such a need. I get the letters and things, and they're desperate. And this morning, Billy said over in his rooms that the phone constantly rang from out of the town, and the people just everywhere come here come over here here just one day just a couple hours you can stop on your road and there's such a tremendous need and i just pray that god will give us such a pouring out tonight till it just the people that's here it'll just be have you so anointed you go into your own communities and, and pray for the sick and the needy it's such an awful need and now quickly as we can to the word Sitting out there just a few moments ago in the car, I was waiting for the call to come in, and it was, uh, while I was sitting there, my mind fell upon this uh, subject here, and I found a little scripture to read in the 65th Psalm, and with the fourth verse. It seems to be a beautiful outline. I like David's, you know, the Psalms are not only songs, but they are prophecy. Did you know that? Did you ever read the 22nd Psalm where the very words that Jesus spoke, his last words at the cross, was recorded in the 22nd Psalm? My God, why has thou forsaken me? All my bones stare at me and, and of all about his conditions. It was spoke in the 22nd Psalm. I believe there's a little, some little rebound here some way. I, perhaps the engineers got a little too high. And can you hear me all right way back? Can you hear me upstairs there? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm a country boy, up, I mean in the balcony, upstairs. <clears throat> that would be one for my wife to get me on. And Sister Woods, you don't re-report that when you get home, see? <laughs> All right, in the, in the 65th Psalm, the fourth verse, let's read this now for uh, a little background for our thought. And now it reads like this, Blessed is the man whom the Lord chooseth and causes to ap approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Now may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of this word. And now the psalmist here said, Blessed is the man who God has chosen to approach him that he may dwell in his courts. That God has chosen to approach him. Oh, how we could 
I believe the Holy Spirit could really dig some things out of there if we would add the time to do it. Now, notice, blessed is the man whom thou hast chosen to approach thee, that he, the chosen one to approach, may dwell in thy courts, and we will be satisfied in thy temple. Notice the approach to God. God has a way of approach. You know, if you're going to visit a king, there's a way you approach a king. There's a way to approach, uh, well, make it more simpler than that. The boy that wants to approach the young lady uh, to get acquainted with her, there's, there's a certain approach. You just can't come up there and say, hey there, like to meet you, shake your hand. She isn't very much of a lady. <laughs> She'll let you know where to get on and off at. <laughs> All right. There's a certain way you want to approach her. You want to come up with, uh, with respects to the lady and so forth. And there's a way to approach all things. And there's a way to approach God. And if we don't know the approach to God, we'll never be able to get an audience with God. That's right. See, you have to know in a court. If you just don't walk up and the judge is on the stand and say, Hey, judge, I want to talk to you a little bit. Somebody will throw you out of the courtroom lock you up, see, for disorderly conduct. The, there's a way you have to approach the judge. And we must find the uh, way of approach to the great divine judge, God himself. <clears throat> when one time, man to angelic beings, perhaps when he came before the presence of the, his majesty, uh, the great king of heaven, perhaps approached in some other way, but since sin separated the relationship. Now, the uh, relationship, now when a man has become a son, if he's going to approach his father, he just walks up to the father and says, Father, I... I come to visit you or to see you about something. That's his approach. But now, to the stranger, there's another approach, you see. And there's approach to God for many different things. Now, if I was going to, if my father was living and I wanted to approach him on a financial matter, it would be a little different from a, another kind of approach. I want to tell him how much I thought of him and so forth. It's the approach you have to use to meet God. Now, when man sinned back in the beginning in the Garden of Eden, he separated himself and severed himself from all approach to God. His very lifeline, he was separated from his Maker with no way at all to ever see him again because his sin, his unbelief, and trusting God had separated him. That's the only sin there is, is your sin of unbelief. Unbelief is your sin. And the only reason today that we're not where we should be, it's because of our unbelief. That's, right. that's it. It's because the, the miracles and things isn't in the church as it should be. It's because of unbelief that's right. separating us. And because that the poor man out there is a sinning and murder and stuff in our world today and all kinds of disastrous things happen is because of unbelief in God. That's all. If we believe, there's just two things you either believe or believe not. Either one. If you do believe, then the works of righteousness follow a believer. And if you do not believe, the works of unrighteousness follow. The only thing it is, lying, stealing, theft, and so forth is attributes of unbelief. And long-suffering, patience, goodness, mercies, and so forth are attributes of belief in God, faith in God. Now, but when man was cut off without, with no way to approach, his only lifeline, everything was cut off. He was left darkly, hopelessly, without any way at all to ever approach the Maker. And then... When God came down hunting for the man, I want you to notice this. It's always God hunting the man, not man hunting for God. Did you ever think of that? That no man at any time or at any age ever did within himself desire to serve God. Never has been. His nature's against it. Now, he might have some kind of an intellectual uh, thoughts that he 
he thinks that he does believe God, but when he actually really believes God, he becomes converted in a new creature as soon as he believes God. He, he may be intellectually believing God, but when he believes from his heart, then he is converted and becomes a, a, a member of the body of Christ when he is converted from his heart, not from his intellect. Now, but man never seeks God. God seeks man. God, his nature is holy and high. The man in the fall is low and degraded. And a man without God is never, I guess might as well say it, isn't it? He's not mentally right. That's exactly right. I can prove it. That a man without God is no more than a brute. Now, that sounds very deep, but I can prove it to you. And the only reason that we have a civilization today is because of Jesus Christ. People say that the religion of Jesus Christ runs you crazy. It gives you your right mind. And you're not right till you do find him. That's true. Now, that I don't mean to hurt your feelings, uh, brethren or gentlemen, see, and ladies. I, I don't mean to do that. But I mean to actually put the thing just the way it is. Yes. Exactly. Christ never makes you lose your mind. He gives you your mind after you've lost it. It's the devil that ta- makes you lose your mind. It's a demon. Look at the... The maniac of Gadaria. See, when he met Jesus, he was restored to his mind, his right mind. And a man without his right mind, no matter how much intellect he has, he's still not sane yet. A man without knowing Christ be, is nothing more hardly in himself than a brute. He'll, for passions and lust, he'd throw the baby out of a mother's arms and ravish her because of his own beastly lust. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Certainly he will. He'll take poisons of alcohol and stuff into his body and tobaccos and stuff that'll poison him and kill him and thinking that he's a smart, educated person. See, he doesn't know any different. You've got to become born again. And then to that man, you become foolish. But in the sight of God, you become blessed. And no matter how much the world tries to say anything about it, you know then that you've passed from death into life because life reigns in your mortal bodies through Christ. So it's just like take a pig and a lamb and let the lamb tell the pig, well, I'd sure hate to be a pig. Look at you watering that slop and all you're doing like that. The pig, if he could talk back to the lamb and say, you mind your own business, old boy. I know what I want. It's none of your business. See, he has no desire to become a lamb because his nature is a pig. Now, the only way you'll get him out of the slop is not wash him up. (laughs) No, no, but change his nature. When you change his nature, you don't have to wash him up. You wash yourself up. <laughs> he gets his nature changed. Is that right? Yeah. Sure. So just polishing and jarring church and, and reading a whole lot and knowing a lot of books and authors and so forth doesn't mean that you're converted. Because you have an intellectual mind that makes you have a mental conception that there is a God somewhere, still you're not a Christian yet until actually you become personal in contact with Christ that changes your heart and nature. Then you become God's child. And the old things has passed away and all things become new again. Now, if you notice, God then, there's no way man could approach, so it had to be the mercy of God. It was God calling to man. Adam, where art thou? Now, today, it's the same thing today that man cannot come to Christ, except God calls him first. See, his nature. If you ever had any nature, any thought of anything of coming to God, God is dealing with you. That's right. Because Jesus said, no man can come to the Father or can come to me except we cannot come to to God except through Christ. Is that right? The Holy Spirit has to call us first. Or we'll never think nothing of it. It'll just be, we'll just go right on and just think of the things of the world. Well, church is all right. Sure, I believe that's okay. But a real touch, God has to do it. Now, the way that God made for Adam to approach, now watch. Adam made himself an approach. He said, now I've got to go out and meet God. So he made himself an apron of fig leaves to cover up his shame. And he found out that God refused that approach. 
And today, a man thinks, now, I'll help Mrs. Jones over here. She's a widow woman. She needs some coal. I'll give to the Red Cross or to some charity organization out of my abundance. I'll join the church. You're only making yourself uh, an approach that God will refuse. That's right. There's only one approach to, uh, to God. Now, God refused Adam's approach. And then God went and made an approach for Adam. He made Adam approach to himself. And by doing that, he slayed some sheep or something and got him some skins. And through the blood, brought the first approach to the world, to God, for sin, for without the shedding of blood, there's no remissions of sin. That's right. That's right. Only blood can make the way. And God provided an approach there for Adam in the Garden of Eden that through the shedding of the blood of the innocent to appropriate an approach to him, then Adam could once more come through the shed blood of the Lamb to the approach and talk face to face again with God through, through the blood, through the approach that God provided for him. Now, that was God's first method of approach to himself for the people through the shed blood. It has been from that day to this day the same thing through the shedding of blood brings the approach to God. Now, many times God has given such as, as symbols and ambulance and so forth uh, making a way to come to that blood. Now, for instance, we'll take Job. When Job was the oldest book in the Bible, and when Job, an old man, and just before that disaster happened to his home, he got kind of wearied. He had a bunch of children, and they were whirly, going out, mingling with the things of the world. And all of we parents know what a feeling that is when your children, your very heart, begins to... Uh, mingle with the world, get out amongst the unbelievers. I don't suppose Billy is present at the time. I think he's out maybe talking to Brother Woods. But in our city, we do not have a Christian school. And there's a bunch of worldly children, girls and boys too. And when I thought of sending my boy to that school, knowing that everything that I drilled into him, unless he become really converted, really come to Christ, that his all of his nature would be changed, he'd be swept out from under my hands as soon as he got with this worldly bunch. Because the very nature in him, no matter being a good boy, that doesn't, having a minister father, a religious home, where we don't approve of any of the worldly things, in our home, we try to live by the grace of God like Christians ought to live. Amen. The influence set before him. Amen. I know if he was lost, he'd certainly walk over a righteous home to be lost by. And I want him to have to walk over my life. And he'd have to walk over the Bible. He'd have to walk over the blood of Christ because I'll certainly, by God's grace, present it in front of him. But if his nature isn't changed, he'll go right on just the same. Yeah. How I think of the day that Billy entered high school and how I thought, oh my, and knowing that he, yep, he had oh, he'd been baptized, certainly, but had never made a full surrender, consecration to Christ, knowing that the nature of a child yet was in him. How my heart yearned for him and how I'd pray, go out in my car and ride around and say, God, don't let my boy get wrapped up in that kind of a stuff out there. How would I, thought, God, I, I hope, I pray his mother's dead and I've been both daddy and mother to him, so please don't let him get wrapped up out there and get in trouble. Some way will you just protect him? Oh, if I had the time this afternoon, it would take hours to explain it how God has towed the red light across Billy's path yeah. time after time. Yes, sir. I seen him here not long ago. I was sitting in New Albany. The baby was getting her teeth filled. The little fella at school hurt her teeth. And then Billy had been out of fish and come in, got a bad cold or something. And I was with some ministers and we were sitting in New Albany. And the wife was up with the little girl getting her teeth worked on. One of 
I was sitting there and something said, get out of the car and start walking. I thought, what was that? I got out and started walking down the street and the Holy Spirit met me there and said, turn home quickly. Billy's at the point of death. And I left him on his bicycle going fishing. Well, he got down there, I think, and fell in the river and, and uh, fishing and got wet and he got a bad cold just hanging around the river. Instead of coming on back up home, he goes around over by Sam's and asks him, that's the, my doctor friend, and said, Doc, give me a shot of penicillin. I'm, I got wet today. I, I don't want to get any bad colds. And, and the doctor gave him a shot of penicillin. And by the time he got home, his toes were that big around. Fell out. My mother-in-law there called him right quick and he ran up there and called a specialist out of Louisville. Had the ambulance up there real quick, tuck him to the hospital, laid him in there and gave him two shots of adrenaline over his heart and his heart gone plumb on 10 over 20, something like that. I rushed home real quick. That minister with me said, how do you know, Billy? I said, you watch and see. We entered into the gates. There stood my mother-in-law, yard screaming at the top of her voice, said, Billy's dying in the hospital. And I just dumped them all out as quick as possible and got out the hospital. A couple of days before, I said, Billy, you're treading on dangerous ground. Get out of the company you're in. I said, the Lord Jesus, show me last night. Just before I went to bed while standing in the room there after prayer, I seen you not listen to what I was saying, but you jumped from a window and I seen you turning head and up and heels up like that, going over and over, going through space. I said, you must stop running with that kind of company. Well, a kid, he just kept on. Then I rushed the hospital out there and here come my little doctor friend down the hall, threw his hat down the hall, said, Bill... I just I believe it just almost killed your boy just a few minutes ago. He said, we got two specialists here. So we give him two shots of adrenaline. Oh, right over his heart. He said, it's still, he's laying there unconscious. Me trying to be as a father, as a minister of the gospel, straighten up, start walking slowly. I said, all right, Doc, you, you're my friend. You've done the best you know how said, I didn't know what he'd be allergic to it. Billy, I've given it to him before. He said, I don't know what happened. And he's wringing his hands because we're bosom friends. And look, he started down the hall. I said, can I see him, Doc? He said, well, we got tubes in him. He said, go ahead. And I slipped in real easy and watched where he was. To pull a door down behind him in there. Billy just face just black as it could be. And his eyes set back, just pumping respiration to him, gurgling in the tube through his nose and everything. His tongue out, his mouth way back, and his eyes set just as black as he could be. I thought, there he is. I knelt down. I thought, God, will you take my only boy? Will, will you take him, Lord, since I've packed him on my arm? And I, I know, Lord, children, you understand. I pray that you'll help him just as quietly as I could before God. Almighty God, who is my judge here before the sacred death, this afternoon, approaching him through Jesus, the Son of God, his own Son who died to save mine. And while I was in prayer, here I repeated that vision again. I seen his feet and head flying around and around as it is going down, down, turning like that, the vision which was a few nights before. And I seen two arms reach out and catch him like that, start bearing him back up like that. In a few moments, I looked up, Billy looked and said, Daddy, where, are, where am I? I said, everything's all right, son. Everything's all right. I went out there and Doc was down there talking to the intern. I waited until he left. I put my arm around Doc. I said, it's all over, Doc. <laughs> said, you think he's going to make it? I said, he's done made it. <laughs> Christ! Hey, man. Talk about an approach. Yes, Job thinking maybe that his children might sin provincially, he said, that they may sin, and I don't, I don't know about it. So he only had one way that he could make the approach, and that was under a burnt sacrifice. So he took the burnt sacrifice and made an offering for his children. He sacrificed for each and every one of his children that maybe, listen, see, maybe they had sinned. Maybe they never sinned around Job Maybe he didn't know nothing about it, but knowing that they were out in the world alone. 
I tell you, what we need today is more good old-fashioned praying mothers and daddies for their children. If we had that, would be the greatest support to do away with juvenile delinquency I know of. First, give me old-fashioned mothers and daddies who pray for their children. Look at here, boy, a girl, this afternoon. If you've got a mother or dad like that, the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, that's your mother's prayers you're walking over the top of. Remember that, and you'll never prosper at all till you turn and surrender yourself to Christ. That's right. Now, Job said they may have sinned. So he offered the best that he had, all that he knew, because that's all the approach he had to God. So he killed one lamb for his own approach. He killed another for one boy and another for another, making a burnt sacrifice for each one to have a way of approach to God. God seeing the honesty and sincerity. Oh, you say that, Brother Branham, now wait a minute. I don't believe that the influence of the Father, I believe it's an individual affair. True, but we are commissioned to pray for one another. That's right. And uh, offer up our loved ones to God that he will save them. Now, notice in all of this, Job kept his mind on God and offering the sin offerings that if they did sin, maybe the approach you say, well, was that New Testament too? Yes. Certainly does. Well, he said, if I get saved in my house, should I leave my house? Not unless you have to. I'd stay right there. For Paul told the Philippian jailer, said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy and thy household shall be saved. Yeah. That's right. The sanctified wife sanctifies the husband. Live like a Christian. Be like a Christian. Pray all the time. Believe that God is there and is going to answer your prayer. Offer it through the provided approach. That's the way Job did. He had approach. That was through the burnt offering. So he'd taken a burnt offering and went out and offered it and approached God in behalf of his children. You see it? He had an approach, so he used the approach in behalf of his children. Now, God, here I come with this lamb. I'm offering it for John. Now, if he has sinned, Lord, I pray you forgive him. He threw the approach of the burnt lamb because that's the only thing he had to approach him. Now, if you ever notice how that when the disaster struck Job's home and the children was all killed and everything and all Job had was destroyed, God wasn't rebuking Job. He was only purging Job. Amen. I like that word, a purge. The branch that bears fruit, then God purges it. That will bring forth more fruit. Trouble it is we think sometimes God's angry with us. But he's only trying to purge us that we'll bring abundance of fruit. Giving us a few trials. The Bible said that they're worth more to you than precious gold. That's right. Did you ever know that every son that cometh to God must first, first, be tried, whipped, child whipping correction. It's not easy. When God gives you a whip and you go out here and say, well, I mingle around a little bit. God give you a real old-fashioned spanking for it. And I'll tell you, if we had more of that than a natural today, we'd have better children. God wants his household straightened out. So it gives you a little whipping so you can get straightened up. makes you love him more. My father used to give me whippings, and I thought, oh, my, I wish I could call the old gray-headed brother, father of mine, back from the other lands today. I would respect every whipping he ever gave me. I never got even as much as I needed. I thought so then. But I don't now because it corrected me. Though he didn't do right himself, yet he wanted me to do right. Amen. <laughs> He wants us to. If the earthly parents wants us to do well, what about our heavenly parents? The Lord Jesus. He has to correct us. And the scripture says, if we cannot stand chastisement or whipping, child correction, then we become illegitimate children and not the children of God. See, if you're really born again, 
Get it now. If you're really born again, there's nothing can separate you from God. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Neither starvation, perils, trials, suffering, death, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You say, well, I started to be a Christian one time. Everything began going this way and that way. And I thought, my, I was better off the other way. You never did come to God, brother. Have you ever really come to God and got a taste of the heavenly gifts of God? Partakers of his divine nature? Why, you can no more become a sinner again, unbeliever, than a stalk of corn could become a cucklebur. That's right. It's your nature. You're made up. You've come the right approach. You come your own approach. You come God's provided approach one time and see what happens. Yes. Job was taking his children through ever. The only provided approach there was the burnt offering. And a little thing I want you to notice. After all the turmoil and everything was over, and then God taking all of his sheep and his cattle and his horses and things, then at the end of his chastisement or purging, God doubled to him. If he had 10,000 cattle, he'd give him 20,000 cattle. Yeah. See? Oh, isn't that marvelous? God purged Job for the purpose to bless him. Amen. Yes. Say, Brother Brown, I'm a Christian and I've got a sickness now. I wonder why it comes. God may be purging you. Amen. Give you some trials. Make you draw a little closer to him. Pray a while. Then heal you and you can have a testimony. Christ heals you. You say, well, I heard he healed others. Then you're, you're, the husband is a partaker of the fruits then. Yeah. <laughs> See it? I thought it was awful hard when I was getting mine. And if it had just been me, I would have failed. But something in me, not me keeping it, it keeping me. Amen. The question is whether I'll hold out or not. It's whether he held out or not. If he held out, I'm sure to be there then. The question isn't whether I can do it or not. It's whether he did it or not. I believe he did it. That settles it. Amen. If that's coming from my heart, which I trust to God that it is, then it's not whether or not what I do, it's what he's done. You say, well, then what about does it give you license to go sin? No, brother. Certainly not. What does it do? If you sin and go on out into what we call sin, drinking and carrying on and doing things wrong, it shows that your heart's not right in the first place. It's got to come from here. Then, when you come that way, God's way, and notice at the end, then after Job had done everything, laid in the way, these provided ways of approaches to God for all of his children, he approached for his children praying in their behalf. If you ever notice, at the end of the road, Job restored back double. God gave him double what he had, purged him, and restored to him. He had 10,000 head of cattle. He had 20. He had 10,000 head of sheep. He had 20. If he had 30,000 head of, of, uh, of goats, why, he had, he had uh, uh, 60. God doubling to him, and then again... I believe he had seven children, and God restored his seven children. Did you ever notice? He never doubled his children. He just restored his children to him. Amen. Why? How did he do it? Through the approach, the burnt sacrifice. That's right. Yes, sir. They were all in glory waiting for him to come. <laughs> God restored Job's children after they were dead. He never restored back, making him 14 children. He restored his animals and so forth back. But he restored to him because why? He come God's provided way of approach to the burnt offering. That's the approach. Abraham, when he was old, he come from the land of Chaldea in the city of Ur and sojourned. God separated him from his people, from all of his associates. Separated him away from his loved ones. 
and sent he and Sarah into a strange land to be with strange peoples, to be a sojourner. Aren't you glad you're a sojourner? A soldier, a pilgrim. Amen. A sojourner, one that is sent out. In other words, Abraham was a missionary or an apostle. He was sent of God to a strange land. And the word apostle means one that's sent. Missionary the same. And in this land... He was a different from the rest of them, so he was an apostle, pilgrim, and a sojourner. Yeah. And that's what every believer that comes to God today through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ is called out of his habitations. You women in your card parties and dances at night and right. your routing and, and all your drinking and your men with your... Sin. God separates you from those things. Calls you out to be a what? An apostle. Sent away from that audience or crowd into a different type of people. To be a what? A pilgrim to the world. A stranger. Oh, I love that old song. They always sing it when we're baptizing. We're pilgrims and we're strangers here. We're seeking a city to come. The lifeboat soon is coming to gather the jewels home. Oh, I just love that old song. I can almost hear the water splashing when we go to singing that. We're singing that when the morning star. The angel of the Lord made his first appearance over where I was standing in public for the first time in my life at the foot of Spring Street in the Ohio River in June 33 as a young Baptist minister there baptizing. Now, Abraham was called for separation to sojourn as a pilgrim and a stranger with what? A promise that God was going to bless the world by him. Called out when he was 75 years old, Sarah being 65, 10 years difference in their age. And he set out and waited 25 years, still trusting, still believing, professing to be a stranger, coming to God through the approach and everything. Still believing that he's going to have the son. And then after he was 100 years old, or 90 and 9, 15th chapter of Genesis, we find that God, after Abraham, Getting way up in the 25 years now, God approached Abraham. He said, now, Lord, I'm getting old, but how I believe you're going to do it, but I don't know just how you're going to do it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I doubt it. It's going to be, Lord. But could you just show me a little way that it's going to be? That's where your little special blessing comes. How are you going to do it, Lord? Now, I'm old. I, you're going to do it. But just, could you show me how you're going to do it? Yeah. Oh, I love that, don't you? Uh, just how you going to do it, Father? Could you show me? Yeah. God said, come out here, Abraham. I want to talk to you just a moment. He said, Abraham, I am the Almighty One. Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. That's how I'm going to do it. I am the Almighty One. The word in Hebrew, El, Almighty, means El Shaddai, which means the Almighty One, or El means God, and Shad means breast. Shaddai is in the plural. I am the Almighty, the Strong One, the All-Sufficient One. You see it? Now, Abraham, watch what that name was that he appeared. I am the El Shaddai. In other words, I am the breasted one, Abraham. The God, the really the word S-H-A-D comes from the, in the Bible, it means the, like the, the woman. The place, the nursing place of the baby. 
In other words, Abraham, I am the strong one. I am the life giver. Not only a life giver like the baby fretting, I am the satisfied. The little baby, if he's fretting, sick, still got the tummy ache, as long as he's laying on his mother's arms nursing, it satisfies him. Oh, my. You get it? He may be sick in his little head, swimming around everything else, but if he's laying on his mother's breast nursing, it pacifies him. No matter how sick you are, what's taking place, how long the Lord is answered, as long as you're laying on his breast, pulling from the Word, it satisfies the believer. That's my approach, he said. That's the way I'm asking you to approach me. I, I am your satisfier. Do you believe it, he said? Amen. I am the one that will satisfy you as you draw from me life. Abraham, you're a hundred years old, but you're just a baby to me. <laughs> See? Well, he said, look at my flesh, how it's wrinkled up, and my hair is gray, and my shoulders are stooped, but I am the life giver. Amen. That's it, Abraham. Do you see it? Abraham believed God then because he had an a, a approach through a symbol, through a name. So have we an approach to a name. Jesus. What does Jesus mean to us? Savior. Amen. El Shaddai to Abraham. Satisfier. Strong one. Salvation giver. Strength giver. The same thing that El Shaddai was to Abraham, Jesus is to the believer. Oh, my, doesn't it just carry you away? This makes things seem so petty, these little things of the earth. You're so... Like, so juvenile to even think of them. We ought to be great giants in God today, not little bitty children. As long as Christ has been with us and blessing us and doing the things He has, and we see His great works and still babies. Paul said, when, well, well, when you ought to be able to give meat, you're still taking meat. Not able to take meat, but still giving milk. That's right, still have to take the milk. Since your milk of the gospel... When you should be strong and eating meat. See? Ah, when we see what God does in His great mighty workings, His Word vindicated, we should be big and burly. That's right. You know why? We just don't eat enough. Now, Abraham, I am the strong one, the all-sufficient one. He was the all-sufficient one for Daniel when he was in the lion's den. He was a strong one that could appear there in a form of a light, and a lion couldn't even approach his presence. He was a strong one in the fiery furnace with the Hebrew children, when his power sufficient to keep the, even the smell of the flames of the smoke off of him. The all-sufficient one. Amen. And what did King Nebuchadnezzar say? He says, I see... Four. You put in three and I see four and one looks like the Son of God. The all-sufficient one. The approach. Sit. Notice now. Here he is. Wonderful. Now, Abraham being old yet, God promised him and said, This is the approach now, Abraham, that you're coming this way through the offering of the blood and I'm behind the blood now as the nourisher, the strength giver, the satisfier, the strong one, the all-sufficient one. Just think of that. Now, he, I am the breasted one. Oh, did you notice it? He never said, I am El Shad, but Shaddai. Double. Amen. The compound. He never only died for our sins, but he died for our sickness. He was wounded. Our approach 
Who is our approach? The Lord Jesus. What was he wounded for? Our transgressions. One breast. What else was he striped for? And by his stripes we are healed. Another breast. Who is he? The I am. The great El Shaddai. The strong one. The all sufficient one. The breasted God to the believer. Amen. And amen. The double killer. Not the double remedy. Doctors has remedies. God has a cure. The church has a remedy, but Christ has a cure. The devil cure. No wonder, I believe it was Charles Wesley said, a double cure is safe and ought to make me pure. Be of sin a double cure, saved from wrath and make me pure. How that God can save you from your sins and from your sickness. The breasted one, the old shoddy eye. In Israel, he was the approach. And when Israel come to a place that they had to be redeemed, God provided an approach. Before he could take Abraham on, he had to show him the approach. Yeah. Before he could take Job through the fiery trials, he had to show him the approach. Yeah. Before God could take Israel out, he had to see the approach. Yeah. So Moses commissioned them to kill a lamb and to sprinkle it in the sign of the cross on the door. And believer, inside the door, after sprinkling, notice it, get the significance of the order of the scripture. The believer, once behind the blood, could no more go out only through the approach. Yeah. Had to go through the blood. Yeah. Death was in the road. The death angel couldn't touch the blood. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Yeah. And the believer had come through the approach. Yeah. God was going to give him miracles. Going to take him away from the garlic pots and let him eat angel's food. Yeah. <laughs> but he couldn't do it till he had an approach. Yeah. Amen. He was going to take him away from the old muddy waters of Egypt and give him living waters out of our life. Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't do it until he made an approach. They just couldn't do it by desire. There had to be a provided approach. They was going to see the Red Sea open. They was going to see miracles take place. But before they could see this thing, they had, that, that's so deep, they had to come through God's yeah. provided approach. Yeah. You see it, Christian? Just not because they desired to see it. Not because you want to see something happen. If you want to see whether Christ is right or not, come through God's approach to him. Yeah. Then you'll know now the uncircumcised tried to come the same thing to do the same thing and they drowned it. That's right. If you don't want to get wrecked up in life, you quit pretending to be a Christian because you're going to find yourself wrecked up out here somewhere. Yes. You come through God's provided way of approach. If I started to go home this afternoon and went cut across the fields, I'd find myself sunk down in a mud puddle somewhere. The highway has an approach to Jeffersonville and I must go the way of the highway. It's easy running if you'll just get in the road. Die out to self. Come through the blood of Christ. Then you can approach the Father. And he'll give you the Holy Spirit that'll make you a believer. Because it's not you that's believing anymore. It's the Holy Spirit in you. Your nature has changed. Oh, I wish we had more time, but it's, my time is gone. Oh, I just love the Word, don't you? Look, before they could see miracles, they had to come to the provided approach. Before they could see the Red Sea open, they had to be a partaker of the glory. Notice, before they could become a partaker of the glory, they had to come the provided approach to God to be a, a partaker of the divine, divine approach, of the divine articles. And before you can ever become a partaker of this blessed heavenly calling, you have to come through the provided approach. Amen. Yeah. 
Not self-sustaining. Not intellectually. But death to yourself and a reborn again in Christ Jesus through the offering of the blood. Then you say, my, why didn't I know these things a long time ago? You were trying to come through your church. You were trying to come through your organization. You were trying to come through the auxiliary or something or another. You were trying to come through your own good works, through your merits. You'll never see it. And you can't approach it until you die to those things and come God's provided way of approach, which is Jesus Christ being filled with the Holy Spirit. God's provided way for sinners to come. You'll never be able to nurse from the Old Testament's goodness and the New Testament's goodness. You'll never be able to nurse joy and peace and satisfaction and healing from your body. You'll stand off and criticize, say, oh, it might have been a long time ago, but I believe the approach is all dried up now. Listen, if Christ is the approach to God, then God is El Shaddai. Amen. Amen. So come the provided way. Don't try to bypass. Come the provided way. Beautiful parable, if we had time to go into it, of the wedding supper. How that the bridegroom give out the robes and invited everybody, and robes made everybody look the same. They stood at a door, and as they come by giving their passes, and the Orients and Indians and so forth, very beautifully still carried on. They give out the robes, and everybody was invited and received a robe. I like that. So then, when they come to the door, there's a man at the gate that tucked their invitation. They had on a robe, and they come in, come in another, another come in. And then when they got in there and the dinner was set, he found one that was there, but didn't have on the garment. What happened? It showed he come in a window, bypassed the door, and come in another way. He didn't come the provided approach because the gate man would have turned him back. The robe makes them all look alike. Yeah. Whether you're rich or poor, bond or free, when the robe goes on you, you look like the others. Yeah. You can't show off fancy clothes and everything when you got the robe on. So then it showed that he come in by a window or come the back door or bypass the door. Jesus said, friend, what are you doing here? And he was speechless. See, God's got an approach. Yeah. And we must come that approach. And every man that comes that approach dies to self, comes to Christ, regenerated, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, the robe of God's righteousness, given up on you, and you live for Christ from then on. You're coming, God's provided approach. Then you got new life in you. The old life of sin has passed away. The old carnal thoughts of God way under years ago. God is a living being, not only out there, but right in here now. All things that he said is the truth, and you believe it every bit. And you don't criticize the others. You don't find fault with your pastor and with all the other the women that talks this way. You pity them and pray for them. You're coming God's provided approach then, you see. What if Christ had found so much fault in you, he wouldn't have died for you. But see, he was God's approach, to, our approach to God through him. You get it? Now notice, when Israel needed healing, El Shaddai. When they needed healing, he had an article, a, a divine article there, which was represented way a serpent that they looked and believed and was healed. Now, I wish we had time, but of course it's, it's getting late. Let's bring it to a close now. Now, all those fine things, many other characters is praying in my heart right now, but I just have to hurry. Watch. Now, what about the Christian approach? How do we approach one day, as God did in the Garden of Eden, taking an uh, innocent lamb, which was in figure, Christ Jesus, and slayed it for a covering, taken off the lamb, stripped the lamb, and put it up on the sinful man that he might have the covering of the innocent. God took his son to Calvary and stripped his flesh from him, pouring out the blood, the life cells in the blood, giving up the Spirit that he might take the righteousness of Jesus Christ and cover the guilty. There's God's approach. Is there any divine articles that goes with it? Yes. 
Then God in his mercy, after setting Christ at his right hand, sent back the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is ordained in the church as symbols. Apostles, teachers, evangelists, gifts of healing, miracles, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, signs and wonders to accompany the church as it goes along for your article. Divine thing. Something to represent yes. that the divine forgiveness, yes. the Holy Spirit is present, which came out of the very life of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. His presence is here. The preaching of the Word brings His presence. Right. The working of miracles brings His presence. And when you come and you say, I'd like to approach God, some says, well, now, how would I approach Him? Come, His provided approach is through Jesus Christ, his son. Then he has other things, teaching of the word. He has preaching of the gospel. He has visions and signs and wonders and miracles and all that come right up to his divine approach that you might lead up to him and lay hold on everlasting life. Way some time ago, thinking of the breasted one, the El Sharia, just before closing, Oh, it was years before the angel of the Lord ever appeared to me. I was sitting in my room praying one night, or my mother's house, rather. My mother's just an old-fashioned country woman. She'd wash her clothes and put a big basket over in a corner, a chair it was, and throw the clothes on a chair. And I was, I was right after I'd lost my wife about three or four years afterwards. And I was batching, trying to, and i come in. I said, Mother, I, I, I want to talk with you a while. She said, sit down, Billy. And I sat down, and we got to talking about the Lord. And and so I went on in the other room, and I said, I just feel like I want to pray a while, Mom. And she said, well, help yourself. And I went into the room, knelt down there, and began to pray. And I prayed till about one o'clock. And I raised up, and I thought, well, I believe I'll wander on up home. And then I looked in the corner. And I thought I seen Mother's chair of clothes, something white. But instead of it being there, it was that light moving, coming towards me. And when I, it got on me, I looked and I seen a little old house, what we call shotgun house, little two or three rooms straight in a row. And so, and I walked up to it going from the south to the north. And when I got into the place that had red paper on the wall, little old poster bed and a little boy laying there. He had a little bitty tiny lips and he had a little blue overalls on like and his little body was twisted around and around and around. His little arms wound up against his side, each leg twisted around and his body twisted but looked like something had been holding from right here and twisted his body up to here. I thought, oh mercy, this must be one of them. I didn't even know it was visions. I'd just been taught that it wasn't and it happened. I couldn't help it. And there I was standing there, I looked a little far and I thought, oh my. That poor little fellow. And the father went and got it and brought it over to me. And I heard a voice standing here. I'd never seen the angel before. I'd never seen it for years after that. But I'd always hear the voice. And he'd stand here, said, Now lay your hands on the baby. And I laid my hands on the baby. And I seen it hit down in the corner, drop out of his father's arms and just one, hit on one leg and it unwound, hit on the other and it unwound. Then the rest of his body unwound. And then he come walking across to me and put his hands up in mine. And he looked like he had a little, like a little mustache of buttermilk or chocolate milk on his lips like this. He said, Brother Branham, I'm perfectly whole. And so I, I come to out of the vision because it was early in the morning and somebody was knocking at the door. And when it was, this man hollering, Miss Branham, is Brother Branham here? And I, Mother, she didn't, couldn't wake up and... I was kind of coming out of it, you know, and I was sitting there, and, and I heard her say, Billy? And I said, yes. She said, someone at the door. And I went to the door and opened up, and it was Mr. Hamill. He said, hello, Billy. And I said, oh, hello there, John. I said, I haven't seen you for so long. I said, come in. And he sat down, and I kept rubbing my face, because my face gets real numb when those things happen. And some people's asking, and they got a letter today, so what makes you always rubbing your face? It feels numb. It feels real thick. And I, so I, I was sitting there rubbing my face, and this been about 16 years ago, I guess. And so he said, uh, well, look, Billy, 
He said, the first thing I want to say that I'm sorry that I did what I have. And I said, what's the matter, Mr. Hamill? And he said, you remember over on the banks of the river that day when you were cutting corn down there in the bottom and we were there fishing and you talked to us about the Lord Jesus Christ? I said, yes. And you tucked me with your overhauls on. Me and my family went out the river and baptized us. I said, yep. Done it at them things many times. When I was game warden, walk around my uniform on in the water and baptize and get up and draw off a little bit and run around and get in my car and take off again on patrol. See, don't matter. You don't have to have so much pomp and stuff. When a believer's ready, baptize him. It's time to be baptized. God ain't no ritualistic affair anyhow. It's he that believeth and is baptized. He said, but Brother Branham, he said, I had two little children. I had two little boys. And I said, that, yes, I remember. It been four, five, six years before. He said, well, I'm sorry I took the road this wrong. He said, I was been working up here in one of these powder plants that I killed a man. And he said, I hit him with a hammer. We was in a fight. And he hit me first. And he was going to kick me into a big vat there where they had some that barling cottons or what it was. And, said, and he hit me and I grabbed a hammer and hit the man and it killed him. He said, I, I served a year for it because it was self-defense. He said, I come home instead of going to God, I started drinking and doing wrong. He said, I lost my oldest child. He said, Brother Branham, said, just an hour ago, the doctor here of the city, Dr. Brunner, just left my house. My other little boy is dying with pneumonia. He said, doctor says he can't make it till daylight. He said, I thought I'd come ask you if you'd forgive me for what I'd done and would come and ask prayer for my baby. Well, I said, sure, brother. I said, he said, I'm going down to get my cousin, which afterwards become one of my associates, Grim Snelling. He said, he's a Christian. I thought we'd all get to pray. Mother, come in. I said, I'll make ready. And you come on back and pick me up. Mother made ready. Uh, I made myself ready, rather, and went out. And Mother said, Billy, what was the matter? I said, and I said, Mother, it's a vision. I said, this man's got a little boy. I believe it's going to be healed. She didn't know him. And I said, well, I believe he's going to be healed this morning. And she said, y you're, going, uh, you're not going now? And I said, yes, I'm leaving now. He's coming back after me. A few moments, he picked me up. We started up the road. And he said, going along up there by the old shipyard over on the side of the river going up. And I said, uh, Mr. Himmel, I said, uh, you, wh where do you live at? He said, uh, I live in above Utica, up in the country. I said, I haven't heard from you for years. I said, don't you live in a little long, like a shotgun house like that? He said, yes. And I said, you come up to a little gate like this and go up some rocks up, and there's a big sycamore tree standing. He said, yes. I said, you got, you got red paper on the walls. He said, that's right. And I said, your little boy is laying in a bed at the right-hand side of the door when you go in. Little iron poster bed. He said, was you ever there? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, when was you, Billy? He said, I've only been living there about two weeks. He said, we come down from uh, Ohio. And I said, I was there about an hour and a half ago. Yeah. And he said, well, Billy, I, I, I don't understand. I said, don't your little boy wear a pair of blue corduroy overalls? He said, he has them on now. I said, that's what I thought. Now I said... Isn't your wife kind of a black-headed woman, kind of thin? said, yes. He said, well, when you was at my house an hour and... I said, yes, Mr. Hamill. I was at your house an hour, hour and a half ago, and vision or some kind of a spirit that take me up there. I said, the Lord's going to heal your baby. And he pulled the brake up on that old Model A Ford, fell over his wheel and screamed out with his hands up, said, God, be merciful to me. I'll serve you, God. And there I put my arms around him and led him back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Two or three years ago, I was in Florida. I heard someone holler, Billy! I looked around him. I always called him. We worked a little bit together. We called him Sir John. I said, over there on the side of the street and by the post office. And I pulled in. He's living down there now. So we went up to the house. And I'll show you just how perfect it is. Now, and I seen in the, the vision, a scene before the baby was given into my hands, the little mother was leaning against the wall like this, and an elderly lady, now there's a red duo suit setting in the room also, and an old lady come in from the door that way and was wiping her glasses, sitting in this chair over on this side, and a young blonde-headed boy, young man, was sitting on the duo here that looked out the window. 
So when I walked in, of course, not knowing about it then, how to take it or what it was, because I didn't know what it was. And so I walked into the room, and as I got in there, I looked narrowly at that little boy laying there, and a mother with this year stuffed over his nose, you know, trying, and crying and going on. He's just barely living. I seen what the vision was. The pneumonia had choked him all out, but here he's going, <coughs> little bitty fella. And I seen that little brown hair, just the boy. And I said, bring him here, Mr. Himmel. You'll see the glory of God. So the little boy, a man picked up the little boy in his arms, excitable, and run him over to me. Watch how I move there. See? I didn't come to the provided approach. See? I said, bring him here. And I got him myself because I seen the vision is going to make him well, but you have to come God's approach. See? And he brought him over there. And I laid my hands on him. And I said, God, I pray that you make this little fellow well. You said you'd do it. And the little fellow gapped three or four times and passed completely out. Looked at him, my mother began to scream, Oh, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And I thought, well, what's happened? Oh, I thought, my, there it is. Oh, here's Grim Snelling standing here. He's the blonde head. that's supposed to be sitting over there with curly hair, but there's supposed to be an old woman sitting in this chair here. There was the French hair thing, but it wasn't right. I didn't come the right approach. And that woman was supposed to be standing there, but her husband, she was supposed to be leaning against the door. And I thought, oh, God, I've killed a baby. I... Oh, my. And the father laid the baby down. She started screaming and crying and everything. I just stood there. I thought, oh, my. What have I done? What have I done? And I waited just a little while. And the baby, oh, just barely living, got worse right now. And I thought, oh, if I've killed that baby, oh, but not killed it myself, but been the cause, if I'd obeyed what he told me to do. But I just let it. And that's true, folks. God in heaven knows it's true here before this Bible. And... I thought, well, now, I walked over and sat down there, and it come daylight, sat there about an hour, and it come daylight, Mr. Snelling said, well, I've got to go to work. He said, I, I thought, oh, my, if they take him, that's the blonde-headed man that was sitting on that dual fall. Uh, 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 if it does, the whole vision's ruined, and I, I've spoiled the whole picture. Me sitting there, oh, I, my heart just was bleeding in me. They'd say something to me, I wouldn't even answer. I just sat there. I couldn't tell them. Because I thought maybe God in some way would rectify it and fix the picture again. So I just sat there, just, just looking. And he said, Brother Branham, uh, um, do you want to pray again for the baby? I said, thanks. I said, oh, oh where's that old woman? And, oh. now, and Brother Graham went and put on his coat. John said, Brother Branham, do you want to go back to Jeffersonville with us? I said, no, thanks. I had to stay there. And I thought, it'll be night before, and that baby can't. I don't see how I can make it another hour. And there it was in that condition, daylight coming, and usually, you know what, sick people right about to break a day. So I thought, oh, here it is. My, what I've done. And the first thing, Mr. Snelling put on his coat and started to go out. Mr. Himmel told his wife, said, well, goodbye, honey. Said, I'll be back as soon as I take Graham on down so he can go to work. And said, um, working at one of those plants, he said, I'll, I'll be back after a while and I'm not going to work this morning. And um, she said, all right, dear. And I was sitting over there, I thought, oh, and I happened to look up out the window and here come the baby's grandmother walking with a little satchel in her hand with a pair of glasses on too, gray-headed, walking around, going into the back. Now, every time she witnessed before, she always come to the front door, but she went back to the little kitchen to come in. And I thought, oh, that's her. That's the woman. I didn't know it was the grandmother of the child then, but I know it was the woman who's in the vision. And so here she come walking right. I thought, here it is. Here it is. The grace of God's going to override. I thought in my heart, you know, I was saying, watching the old woman. And she come around and went in the back door. And um, when she opened the door, I said, who is that? And Brother Graham was standing at the door, him and Mr. Hamill fixing to go out. So the mother went to open the kitchen door to look into the kitchen. And the, old, the mother, the baby, the young woman, looked out there and here... And he said, oh, it's mother. And John and Grim just turned around. And when they did, I raised up from where I sat because Grim was supposed to be sitting there. So I, I raised up and looked back. And the mother comes. She said, call the baby by name. She said, is the baby still living? Is it better? And the wife said, no, it's just about dead, mother. And she put her hands up on the wall and started crying like that. You know, just boo-hooed against the door like that. Kissed her mother. And the old woman, I thought, where are you going? Watch her. And she went over and sat down in that chair and tuck off those glasses because coming out of the cold weather, it had frosted on the outside and was rubbing her glasses. I thought, perfect. 
If Brother Grimm will just go sit down on that. And Brother Grimm, being in relation to him, started crying because a young woman was crying and went and sat down in the same place. Oh, my. Now that's right. I stood there. I said, Mr. Himmel, will you forgive me? He said, what? I said, do you still have confidence? He said, yes, Billy, why? I said, I spoke out a term a while ago. I said, I'm sorry and I'm repenting before God. That's the reason I haven't said nothing for these two hours or more. I didn't wait for the vision. Brother Graham raised up or the, what was revealed to me. He said, well, what, what do you mean? I said, everything's in order. If you still believe me, bring the baby here now. And the father picked up the baby, walked over there. And I said, Heavenly Father, forgive me for my stupidity. For my era, now fulfill what you said you would do. Laid my hands on the baby. It threw its arms around his daddy's neck and said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And everybody began screaming and shouting. They thought they had a Salvation Army up there on that hillside. Then when, when the little baby, after, after a few minutes, I said, Now let us go. Said, Brother Bill, is my baby well? I said, According to what was showed me, the baby come out of the corner and it... Twisted three times. One on this leg this way and one on this leg back this way. Then his body untwisted. Three steps, meaning three days. I said, for what told me, three days, this baby will be normal and well. So they laid it back on the bed and it was talking to its daddy. Couldn't even breathe hardly before. We went, got the car, went home. I told the church that Wednesday night. And I said, how many wants to go up? Day after tomorrow night and watch when I go out the door and see if that little baby, they know nothing about it up the home now. I said, see if that little baby don't come to me and put its hands in mine and say, Brother Bill, I'm perfectly whole and have milk on its mouth. I said, see if it don't. See? And a whole truckload went up and they gathered around the windows and then I got out of the truck, went and knocked on the door. This poor people, no rug on the floor. The road began to flow across there and the children... A child was playing on the floor with another little kid which had come up to visit from a neighbor, a little girl. And when I knocked on the door, Mita, my wife, which now is, we wasn't married yet. She was standing close to me, three or four people. And Miss Himmel said, oh, it's Brother Bill. She said, come in, Brother Bill, I want to show you something. I looked at them like that. We walked into the room. And when we stood there, the little boy was playing with some blocks over the corner, raised up and looked at me, been drinking milk and had the little mustache across his mouth, walked over, took a hold of my hand and said, Brother Bill, I'm perfectly whole now. What is it? Three days nursing on El Shaddai. God's divine promise coming, God's divine approach. He has an approach. Do you believe it? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank Thee today. Oh, how our hearts burn because we still have the divine approach. We have every article of the Bible, vivid evidence right here and now, all sufficient God to provide everything that we have need of. And God, today I approach now through the all-supreme sacrifice for the law having a shadow of good things to come, the burnt offerings, just the shadow, as Job come through the shadow, but not the very image of the thing can never make the comer unto perfect. But this man, Christ, died once for all and settled it forever. God's one and only approach to himself to Jesus Christ, His Son. Through the shed blood, through the wooing of the Holy Spirit, I uh, ask today that this road be open to every person in divine presence. Grant it, Lord. The night's coming on. Healing service is coming. And Father, just now, if there be any here that's wayward and indifferent, doesn't know yet, doesn't know just how to come, Maybe they've just went along and never tried really to come and get born again and then approach you. They're trying to approach you on the outside. May they come in through Christ just now. Come to the breast of the El Shaddai, which was wounded for our transgressions. And then in return tonight, lay their head over on the bosom 
of the Mother God. The only one who could give us birth rightly is God, our Mother and our Father and our, our Redeemer, our loved one, oh, all in all. God grant it just now, sweetly, while the music's playing, may every wayward soul just now come to the entrance of the gate of the paradise of God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, just now, or a backslider, or I come thy provided way through the Lord Jesus. Accept me, Father, while we have our heads bowed. I wonder if there'd be one, two, how many, anywhere in the building, raise up your hand and say, Brother Branham, I've been just a little dilatory, kind of jumping around, kind of hoping to come to God through some kind of an experience or maybe because I had a feeling, seen lights. or But just now I'm laying all that aside. I'm coming God's way. I'm coming by the way of the cross just now. I raise my hand to Almighty God and say, God, be merciful to me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You, you, you. God bless you. Keep praying everywhere. God bless you. God bless you. You, you. Oh, my. Up in the balcony, somewhere up there, somebody say, Brother Brandon. Just now, by faith, I've moved up to the door. I see it. I see that none of my ways could do. My own thoughts is no good. My own thoughts about divine healing is no good. I'm trying to beat against the iron wall. The more I come, the more I beat, the worse I get. I can't get no word, Brother Branham. So I'm going to accept what you said just now. I'm coming God's provided way. I'm coming just as simply, unconsciously to the, any surroundings around me. I'm coming to the Lord Jesus by the way of the cross and accepting him as the strong one, as the El Shaddai. God bless you, Dad. Old gray-headed man with his hand up feebly shaking wants to be remembered. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, look at them. Yes. Dozen or more hands around, maybe two dozen. Raise their hands. Some old fellows, poor brothers, that's wandered along, maybe joining church or trying to do good. That was all fine, Father. You've seen them when they went up to the church and put their name at the church. You've seen them, Father, when they've done those good deeds to the people, give their substance, fed the widows, haul the coal for the poor old woman, didn't have any, chop the wood for the neighbor. Help that man out on the side of the road, put the nickel in the, the parking meter to keep the cop from giving their brother a ticket, maybe a man they'd never seen, but they just passed by and felt sorry for him. That was good. You've seen it, Lord. You love them for it, and now you spoke to their heart, and they want to come through thy provided way now, not by what they've done, but by surrendering their own will to thine and receiving thee as their Savior, just now receive them, Father. For we ask in Jesus' name, with your heads bowed and in prayer, if you will. I'm going to ask Brother Joseph if he'll come and finish the altar call while I slip to pray, get ready for the healing service. I want everyone that raised their hand to come here and personally pray to the Lord Jesus while the music is playing, you in prayer. God be with you till I see you tonight. <laughs>